Okay, we're going into part two on lost knowledge of the ancients. Was man the first? And if you haven't seen part one, I normally tell you to go in the very end of this video and look in the top left hand corner and it'll take you back. But because this is a four parter, we can't do that. It's no longer the format they let you use. So what we're going to do is, uh, if you're watching this, you can either go to my site and uh, my channel and look up part one, or you can just go ahead and watch this, which is part two, three, and then in part four, at the end of part four, I will put part one back in there too for anybody that has missed it along the way, and you'll be able to go back and watch at least the first one again. Okay, so let's just get started here. This is an ancient Greek temple here, and you can see the statues around and everything, but there's a large form of people here, and what I believe we're looking at is Asclepius talking to somebody that's right here. There are sick and hurt people here and here, and I can bet that he's going to come and help him in a little bit here after he gets through talking. You can see people scribing stuff down, like these guys over here and this guy talking to him. You can see uh, somebody looking in a book right here, and a child's helping to hold it up pretty neat quite the conversation going on over here and here there are people that are musing on things and I, what I always thought was neat about this is here's a guy reading a book and just over his shoulder somebody's cheating and marking it down you can see that you can look at this all day and may not notice some things but the corbelled areas that are up in here are honeycomb and they're hexagram shaped and then these archways that come up here and down here are actually swastikas. They're perpetual and interconnected with each other, making up the design that goes across the entire arch. And that symbology goes back to many, many ancient people that don't have anything to do with World War II whatsoever. For I think we're a little before that time now. In fact, I'm certain of it. The lost knowledge of the ancients were humans the first, this is part two again, until documents of bygone ages are unearthed, located and recovered, we are stuck with sacred text, classical writings and myths of the past. Can these documents we know now be considered as reliable material for constructing, constructing a picture of the past? So we're questioning whether or not myths and legends could be true. Let's take a look at that lost places right there are lost places and lost civilizations and everything right lost in tribes we know those are too 150 years ago no scholar took the iliad or the odyssey of homer as history but heinrich schliemann put faith in it and discovered the legendary city of troy itself then, like a sleepwalker, he followed the homeward route of Odysseus and discovered Golden Mycenae. So it did exist. And here's just some of the riches that were found in there with it. Golden stars, nice sheaths, all kinds of stuff. Lots of gold, lots of incredible artifacts. But once we finally excavated those islands there that got blown up and Santorini and all those things you come to find that they had plumbing and all kinds of advanced stuff we'll talk about that a little bit we get through this though here that's gold artifacts from grave circle a at Mycenae Greece the city of Ur which I talk about a lot referred to in the Bible as the town for which Abraham had come was not afforded any geographical or historical significance by the sages of the 19th century and pretty much before they actually, until recent times, few historians have taken the Bible seriously as a source of historical data, but after Sir Leonard Woolley had discovered the ancient city of Ur in Mesopotamia, the situation began to change. Well, many people say, well, it kind of changed for the worse, and there was a reason that they wrote off Babylon in the Bible, so you'd never go check it out, apparently, because as soon as we did, we find this ancient story, and hey, that's the flood story, and hey, this... Well, you look in their tablets, and that is the flood story, and oh, they've got all that. And so, well, now he came from Earth, so it should be straight along with it. But it's funny how everybody hears a holy land, holy land, holy land, instead of where it actually came from and who the people really were, as opposed to tagging one out of the group of the tribes somehow. 
we can easily see how that worked out and the way future went on and it's not quite that way is it yeah and who was supposed to be a servant a servant when Noah occurred that didn't work out either did it ha <sighs> Legends can therefore be interpreted, though, as fanciful records of actual happenings. The myth of the birth of Zeus in Crete points to the Cretan origin of the ancient Greek culture. Until 1952, when Michael Ventris decoded Linear B script of Crete and ascertained that it was early Greek, no one in ancient or modern times had taken this Zeus myth, or any of them, really seriously. So, as we can see, folklore preserves history in the guise of colorful tales. And I've tried to show you many of those. Uh, there's a video a guy's got out that he did like 50 of them. And it's, it lasts a couple of hours. But I don't want to even do a review on it. Here's a K tablet inscribed with Linear B script from the Messian Palace of Pylos. There's also Linear A. And a form of it seems to go back real far. In his dialogues, Plato made reference to an archaic form of Greek language. Naturally, his contemporaries had never heard of this lost dialect, but in late 19th century, an old script was found which, when deciphered in the 50s, don't do this to me, God knows why, just every once in a while it goes, I, I, duh, duh. Where are we at? Lost language. But in the late 19th century, an old script was found, which when deciphered in the 50s, turned out to be pre-classical Greek. In the Critias, Plato tells the story of Solon, whom the priests of Sais in Egypt confided in 550 BC that 9,000 years before their time, Greece had been covered with fertile soils. And now that information is scientifically correct because of the soil of Greece was rich a few thousand years ago. In the remote period of the Sahara was a steppe where abundant vegetation grew in the green Sahara. But this is one example of the climate change which has taken place in the Mediterranean basin. How could Plato and Solon, know, or the priest of Sais, have known about the soil erosion in Greece or the green Sahara and things for so long a period unless accurate records had been kept for 10,000 years by these Egyptian priesthood? Here's a picture here, but this is uh, not him talking to the man in Sais. This is Solon and Croesus, and here he is in front of him. There's a slave. There's a maiden girl that's helping him out. Here we have a mage, or his sidekick, and some of his advisors and his retinue, if you will, off behind him. Here's the ancient priest of Solon going around finding out about things. Hmm. Amazingly how advanced they make him look. Lost art. Even further back in time, there were ebbs and flows of cultural progress. The rock paintings of aurochs, horses and stags and other beasts in the caves of Altamira La Co, France, and Rib Zadella and others are masterpieces, not only of prehistoric art, but of art in any period. I'm going to make a note of finishing my video on... Um, Archimedes and some of the ancients and what their names meant and how that shows you that the Medes had some stuff going on that he was able to get a hold of the information of and that's why he retained that name it seems. The ancient Egyptians, Babylonians and Greeks painted stylized bulls but the bisons or horses of Altamira and Laco look like they might have been painted by Leonardo or Picasso. In fact I believe it's a famous quote Picasso went and saw these and whenever they went into the cave, after looking astonished for just a matter of moments, he said, we have learned nothing. We have brought nothing special to art. That these people of that many years ago were already making incredible art. The realism and beauty of these cave paintings can, makes them immensely superior to the paintings of animals in Egypt, Babylon, or Greece even. You can kind of see it in the shading of the way they look and around the eyes. This type of picture right here is something that a modern cartoonist would type come up with with this board that's right here. Quite striking. 
There are other ones, though, that instead of the bull just being like this, it's actual Taurus, and it's got the dots and everything make it up, and on his shoulder are the Pleiades. Orion is out in front of it just like it's supposed to be, and then there's all these dots on the wall that delineate 28 days to a moon, but also it's written on the wall in a place that a shadow casts that they say would have been a sign of a certain time of the year, too. So they had it going on quite a bit. And like I say, Picasso came in there and saw those things, and he goes, wow, well, we thought we took it all to new levels, but here are these people back here thousands of years ago. Sketches and trial pieces have also been discovered in the cave, suggesting the existence of an art school over 15,000 years ago. This is another example of the way a wave reaches a peak and curve of civilization and then goes down. One wonders if maybe they just lost their people. Or in other times, it seems like it correlates with perhaps a war or something happening, and those people may have killed off their priest, and then so here we got to start all again from people that didn't know everything. Because sometimes those priests didn't tell everybody everything. And then all of a sudden something gets lost that shouldn't be lost. And it turns into a legend. Legend becomes myth, and then, then what? Well, how about lost astronomy? In recent centuries, we've been rediscovering forgotten ancient science. Almost 400 years ago, the great German astronomer Johannes Kepler correctly attributed the cause of the tides to the influences of the moon. He immediately became a target for persecution. Yet, as early as the 2nd century BC, the Babylonian astronomer Seleucus spoke about the attraction which the moon exercises on our oceans. Poseidonus, ding, in 135 BC, made a study of the tides and highly concluded that they were connected with the revolution of the moon around the earth. They also noted this somewhat with the Egyptians, and there's a connection to the water and tides that are out there, and a connection to Yah, their moon god. For he actually makes quite a few things happen. For if he's able to pull and push on the world and make the tides ebb and flow, that's the circulature motion that keeps everything kind of going a little bit. At least they were th thinking along those lines. There's Johannes Kepler there. Astronomer and uh, optician, right? Yeah, optician. But we can see that... Uh, compass right there and I bet that man knew a lot of things during that time which now are commonplace but back then weren't so right during the course of 14 centuries from Ptolemy to Copernicus not a single contribution to astronomy was made very little if none even in Ptolemy's time, thinkers looked back to the former centuries of knowledge as if it had been a golden age of science in the past. Well, one thing they're leaving out here is the Muslim people started naming the stars and doing things too, but then all of a sudden the people that were running it told them that math and that type of thing was evil, and uh, so they had to quit doing it, and man, they suffered because of it by far. And then much more bad things happen and admix and all kinds of things, but uh, that's not here, nor there. The ancient Indian astronomer text Surya Siddhanta recorded that the Earth is a globe in space. In the book Huang T. Ping King Su Win, the learned Chi Po tells the Yellow Emperor of China, 2600 BC, that the Earth floats in space. <clears throat> One where, wonders where that knowledge had come to them from, but we won't go into that. Only 450 years ago, Galileo was condemned by ecclesiastical authorities for teaching this very concept. I've told you a few times that they describe in Sumerians that the stars in our Milky Way are just like our sun, but as a torch in the distance, far, far away. And it takes till modern time before people grab that up again. In fact, there was a great gap in mankind. It was brought about by plagues and famine and actual religion 
and trying to dominate each other drove crap out of people and it's taken us 1500 years not 2000 to get back going real good really stagnated for quite some time <clears throat> they had steam engine technology ready to go whenever all that fell apart too <clears throat> I'm not saying they had a locomotive ready to go next week I'm saying that they would have developed things out of that and it wouldn't have taken them until the 18th century to do so Diogenes of Apollonia, 5th century BC, affirmed that meteors move in space and frequently fall to Earth and that they are not falling stars. For all the stars are still there, and one fell, and they're all still there. Yet yeah, we still call them falling stars. Yet the 18th century pillar of science, Lavoisier, thought otherwise. He says, it is impossible for the stones to fall from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. Well, we kind of know now who was right, and was it 5th century or 18th? That shows you a pretty good gap of 1,300 years of duh, and it's not like right after Lavoisier said that, they went, oh, yeah, here's the real deal. So, who is this guy all happy and pointing in things, and this is Democritus. He gave an accurate description of the Milky Way. Ooh, let's look at that. 2,500 years ago, the great philosopher Democritus, Democrats, said that the Milky Way consists of very small stars closely huddled together. In the 18th century, so much later, the English astronomer Ferguson wrote that the Milky Way was formerly thought to be owing to a vast number of very small stars within, so he kind of heard about it somewhere, but then he said, the telescope shows it to be quite otherwise. Without a telescope, Democritus was certainly a better astronomer than Ferguson. It was a case of a large telescope, but a small mind against a great mind without a telescope. So here we're looking at the Milky Way band across the sky and our now form of astronomy that we have going on. I believe this is up on Hawaii. Uh, VTL in the Chilean Atacama Desert. I stand corrected. Seeking the source, he tells you. From this collection of examples, we can see a pattern of knowledge existing in the distant past that has been lost, only to reemerge as new. It seems likely that other valid knowledge existed in the past that we currently do not know of or is not considered reliable according to reason of of all modern criteria. The loss of documentation means we can't always be sure of the ancient source or have the evidence to prove it or its validity. And so it's believed to be folklore, myth, and storytelling. But people tell you there's always a fragment in there of truth. But the above instances are evidences of there often being some truth within those. Perhaps we should give some more ancient sources more credit and seek to investigate the ideas further. For ancient sources that have turned in out to agree with modern truth, the question remains, who provided these insights and on what are they based? Ancient science? Ancient reason? Some other source? And more at the question is, why did we turn off that machine and then get going again. If you look at what happened to us in the last few hundred years, the world could be a different place. And without the Caucasians, it doesn't look like it would be quite anywhere. But, so now we're going on to part three. In your top left-hand corner, we will go to part three in a moment. You'll see it come up there. There it is. Go ahead and click on that and go to the next one. Hey, and come back and leave a comment if you'd like, or maybe write a comment while you're watching the next one. We'll see you there. Peace.